Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by The Black Tux, high quality rental suits and tuxedos, ordered online and delivered to your doorstep. To get $20 off your purchase, visit theblacktux.com slash twist. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? ZipRecruiter has revolutionized how you do it. Their technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. Try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I'm an angel investor and the host of this podcast here in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And I have the greatest job in the world. I get to meet with founders who want to change the world and... Once in a while, I get to join them on that journey by writing a check and helping them grow. Today on the program, two amazing founders working on two radically different concepts, both of which could help humanity in a major way. And that's one of the great things about entrepreneurship. If you're out there thinking, should I be a founder? Should I be an entrepreneur? Understand that almost all the great changes that happen in the world happen because founders decide that they're going to change the world and they're going to bend the world to their vision. First up is Kevin Eisenfratz, Kevin Eisenfratz from ContraLine. ContraLine is the only startup pitch deck that made me faint. And I'm not kidding you. I literally almost fainted when I got to page five or six of this deck. And we're going to find out why I almost fainted right now. Kevin, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jason. Kevin, explain to our audience uh, briefly what ContraLine is aiming to do and why I almost fainted. (laughs) So ContraLine, we're a medical device company and we are working on a new male contraceptive. So right now there's only two male birth control products out there. There's condoms and vasectomy. You almost fainted because we were, there was a slide describing some of the pros and cons of the vasectomy procedure. And basically at ContraLine, we're developing the first option for men that is long lasting and easily reversible, uh, kind of like the IUD for men. Right. But what you failed to describe was, and this will be a a graphic alert, a man's testicles flayed open (laughs) with uh, clamps on either side of the van's deference, I believe, ready to be clipped. Yes. It's a bold choice for slide five in a deck. I will say that, Kevin. It got your attention. It did get my attention. I'd never seen exactly how graphic that procedure was. And it leads to... um, My next question, which is condoms, people have routinely complained about them uh, not uh, being the ideal way for certain people wanting to have sex. Uh, I think many people prefer not to use condoms. Uh, And they're not perfect, obviously. There's many people who, uh, many children out there who were born because of a, a malfunctioning condom. And then second, a vasectomy is not reversible. I mean, people try, but it's not generally... I think people believe it's not reversible or it's hard to reverse and it's incredibly invasive and it's incredibly scary. So what have you come up with? What does ContraLine do in terms of uh, providing a choice for men to take control of their reproductive health? Yeah. So our product is, and and mainly it's a procedure that is a non-surgical alternative to the vasectomy procedure. Rather than exteriorizing or pulling the vas out of the body and cauterizing it or cutting it, which is what happens during a vasectomy, we've designed a procedure that's minimally invasive. It's virtually painless and we can just implant a hydrogel or this gel device into the vas deference. Uh, Once it's implanted, it works by blocking sperm from traveling through, and it's really effective. It's non-hormonal, so none of those systemic side effects that come with the female contraceptive uh, options. And the holy grail is basically the reversibility that the man could come back for the reversal procedure and we can dissolve the gel in minutes. And so that's that's the whole appeal. So to... To recap and explain it in even more plain English, you shoot something into the vas deferens that is a, a, a gel of some type, and that gel does not, uh, it allows, it does not allow the sperm to go through it. 
right. does allow other fluids to go through. Right. And so to be graphic here for a minute, a man would still ejaculate, but there would not be sperm in that ejaculate. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. So the man would be shooting blanks and would never know the difference. I, I, I see you use the technical term shooting blanks. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was trying to be a little more clinical here. But uh, this then, is it a gel or is it, you called it a hydro gel? Explain what that is exactly. If I, if for a, a lay person to understand, what is, what is it, this gel? Is it like nanotubes or something? How would you describe it? So hydrogels are these interesting materials that um, basically they could be injected as a liquid and they form this gel uh, once they're in the body. And it's uh, the body basically thinks that it's almost like tissue because it it's able to absorb water and it has pretty strong mechanical properties like organs and tissue, but it's also not a preformed device. It's not like, you know, a bone or silicone implant. It's, it's injected as or, a liquid. Or a stent or, a stent, or something. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it, it kind of feels a little bit like it's tissue and it's very biocompatible, meaning it's safe in the body. And hydrogels are already used for a lot of different applications like facial fillers and plastic surgery. They're used for sealants, embolization devices. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar market, but no one has thought of using a hydrogel to occlude the vast deference for contraception. Got it. Now, uh, I'm uh, an investor in the company. Uh, we were introduced, I believe, by Cyan Bannister over at Founders Fund, also an investor. Uh, and it's the first time we've invested in a medical device. We thought this was a pretty interesting idea because uh, if young people, young males want to take control of reproductive health, they would have an opportunity to do so. How do you change male behavior, which has almost universally been to put this issue on women. How do you plan to change their behavior? Or is it too early? Because I know that you're just starting to you know, refine the technology. But do you have a plan to change men's minds about, hey, this is something they should participate in and take ownership of? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, I don't know if Contraline is necessarily going to change men's mind. I think it's already happening as we speak. And that's why the time for Contraline is right now. Uh, basically, the entire society is realizing that there's a lot of side effects that come with female contraceptives. The pill has a high discontinuation rate. Um, and basically, men do want more control over their reproductive health. Just to give you a couple examples, uh, concrete data, uh, there was a study done a few years ago by the WHO where they were injecting testosterone into men to suppress sperm count. And it was hormonal. It had a lot of side effects. I mean, 1,500 side effects and men had to get an injection every two months. And 82% of men said that they would do it again in a heartbeat. So I think that uh, there is demand and we just need to put a product on the market and I think men will want it. As another example, we actually launched a website, uh, contraline.com slash participate, where people can sign up and tell us they're interested in our clinical trials. To be honest, uh, we, we haven't done any marketing, no tweets, no Facebook uh, posts, and we just wanted to see who would find it on our website and sign up. We've already have hundreds of signups from mainly men. 95% of our signups are men saying that they are interested in trying our product. And the highest age group are actually 24 to 29. So millennials that are not ready to have kids, but want to have temporary contraceptives. And then the other big age groups are like 30 to 34 or, or 21 to 24. So basically what I'm trying to say is that's younger than I would have thought. I would have thought this is something that people in their 30s or 40s want, but you're saying even in the 20s, people are considering this. Yeah, exactly. I think that the IUD, it, it, a great example is the IUD or the intrauterine device for women. It's the fastest growing contraceptive on the market, uh, growing 10% annually because it's long lasting and reversible. And if we can provide an option like that for men, then I think that they're going to want it. I'm not saying every guy in the world is going to get our product. I'm not <laughs> delusional and trying to pitch every man in the world. But if I had to estimate, I would say 30 to 40% of the men I talk to are very receptive to our okay, procedure. Okay, when we get back from this quick break, I want you to explain, and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to cross your legs and take a deep breath. I want you to explain. <laughs> Keep it together in the control room, please. I want you to explain exactly what you're going to do to 
start the procedure, and I want to know how you're going to reverse the contraline procedure. I want you to walk us through exactly what happens. Take a deep breath, gentlemen, when we get back on This Week in Startups. Ah, yes. Do you have a wedding or event where you need to wear a beautiful suit or even a tuxedo? Well, TheBlackTux.com is your answer. That's TheBlackTux, T-U-X, dot com is your answer. They have high-quality rental suits and tuxedos that you can order online and have them delivered to your doorstep. You can create a look or choose from tons of stylist-selected outfits. Yes, the suits usually retail for $1,200. But at the Black Tux, they start at just $95. Expert customer care is available, and they will back you every step of the way. It's free home try-on. You can see the fit, feel the quality of the suit months before your event. And after ordering, your suit will arrive 14 days before your event. And after ordering, uh, it's just super easy. You're going to get that suit. And if anything is less than perfect, the Black Tux will send you a free replacement right away. When the event is over, you just drop your rental back in the mail. Shipping is free both ways. Super easy. So here is your call to action. To get $20 off your purchase, visit theblacktux.com slash twist, theblacktux.com slash twist. That's theblacktux.com slash twist, T-U-X, on Tux. For $20 off your purchase, Premium rental suits and tuxedos delivered seamlessly and easily, and this is just a phenomenal service. You think about the old days when you had to go to a store, you had to find one, were they open, what were the hours, and were the suits any good, were they ill-fitting, and it was super expensive, and you got ripped off, and it took a lot of time. This takes less time, it's super easy, it's super fast, and it's super high quality, just like all these great online services now, servicing customers directly. So go ahead and visit theblacktux.com slash twist. Uh, one of our uh, sales team members just used it for uh, in a wedding he was going to, and he got a tux, and he wouldn't shut up about it. He loved it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can find this startup at thisweekinstartups.com. You can find us on the Twitter, TWI Startups. You can follow me on LinkedIn. Just do a search for Calacanis, my last name. And uh, we post a lot of exclusive clips there, get a lot of feedback on them. We talk to all the listeners on LinkedIn. We have a great time over there uh, talking business. And you can follow me. I'm at Jason. If you have a great startup like Contraline or Uber, Thumbtack, Wealthfront, Robinhood, Com.com, or the other startups I've been lucky enough to invest in, and you want to reach me, it's very simple. Jason at calacanis.com. That's my email. You will get a bounce that says this email gets a lot of email. This email account gets a lot of email and I probably won't read it. That's a lie. I just put that up there to dissuade people who are not, uh, don't have a lot of tenacity. I read every single one of those damn emails and I respond to a lot of them. So uh, today on the program, we have Contraline and coming up, we'll have Spiral Therapeutics and they are doing something very interesting with ears. And uh, I'll just tease it a little bit here. But Kevin, uh, when we left you, we understand what Contraline is. It's a reversible uh, vasectomy. I, don't, I know you don't call it that, but it's a reversible uh, procedure. And we're going to go through the procedure right now. Do you have to cut me open and how does it work? How painful is it? How much time does it take? And eventually, what will it cost? Great question. So one of the really big innovations behind Contraline is we've actually designed this procedure to be non-surgical. What do I mean by that? Well, rather than actually during a vasectomy, basically the urologist makes a very small puncture. They, It's not an incision. It's a small puncture. They pull out the vas out of the body and then they cut it or cauterize it. Well, we said, okay, why do you have to pull this tube out of the body? Why can't we just do the injection kind of like a flu shot through the skin? And so as mm. long as there's local anesthesia, it should be virtually painless. And, and that's the first question my co-founder, John, Dr. Herrer, and I asked is how do we do this non-surgically? 
to make it really appealing. And so that's our procedure is basically the physician finds the vas deferens. They already know how to do this like the back of their hand. They apply local anesthesia. It could be injected or it could be sprayed on. That's the only painful part of this. It's like get, it's like getting a dental procedure where you get a really quick local anesthetic and then you don't feel the rest. And oh, that's fine. And then once they secure the vas to the skin, they basically can do the injection through the skin. It's technically called percutaneous and get the gel inside the vas deferens. One of the ways we do that is we actually tell the urologist to use ultrasound as guidance. So they already have an ultrasound machine in their clinic and they find the vas with an ultrasound, they see it, and then they guide the injection. They see the gel form on the ultrasound to know it was done correctly. The ah. total procedure, we're anticipating maybe 10, 15 minutes with, with some training, maybe 20 minute maximum procedure. And that's it's about the same time as a vasectomy with training. I think a urologist could do it quicker. Um, in terms but under of, an hour in and out. Yeah, exactly. And am I going to be sitting on an ice pack like my friends who've had vasectomies did for two days? We are anticipating that you will not be at all. So because wow. this procedure is way less invasive than, than a vasectomy and it's percutaneous, really, I think the guy should forget it ever happened a couple hours after the procedure. Wow. Um, so that's our goal is basically to have a procedure that's so quick um, and appealing as well as the reversal. So talking a little about the reversal, I can't talk too much about how we reverse it. But what I can mm. say, it's the procedure is almost identical to the way that we insert the gel. But rather than uh, in injecting a gel, we're actually able to dissolve the gel and then flush it out. So it's the okay. same time period. It's, it's also painless. Um, and, and that's the goal. Okay, I want you to give me two ranges. The first range is how long will this uh, technique last? In other words, what's the shortest to longest you think it will last? I know we're in trials. When in a range will this occur? So how long does the contraline procedure work for me? A range in years. And then when will it be available in years and then cost ballpark in range? Are we talking about thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars? Give me those three ranges. I know it's early and this product is going to take a while. So we do have to go through FDA approval. You know, the good news is that this is a medical device. It's not a drug or a combination product. So the commercialization pathway is pretty well understood. We're in preclinical trials and we hope to be in humans in a couple of years. And so uh, in terms of the lifespan of the product, I think that it's something that obviously we're exploring in our animal studies and in our trials. Um, our goal, like I said before, is to be the IUD for men. And if you look at IUDs, there's a variety of lifespans. There's a three-year one, there's a five-year one, there's a seven-year one, and there's even the copper one that's 12 years. And I think there's a product for the different types of men out there. So men in their 20s may not want something that's 10 years long or maybe even five years long because – they might just want something that they come in every couple of years. Whereas a guy who's maybe 35 and family complete might want something that's more permanent or, or long lasting like 10 years. So our goal is how do you get to market as quickly as possible with a product that is safe, it works and it's appealing. And eventually we hope to have a range of, of lifespans uh, of the product. Okay, I got that. So it could be three to 12 years, whatever, who knows. Uh, and cost and when will we be able to see this procedure in market? Worst case, best case. Yeah, our goal case. conservative is to have our product FDA approved by 2022. Um, and so that that's our goal. We're on track to hit that. And in terms of cost, that's a great question. You know, to be honest, we're a little early in figuring out what the cost is going to be. But the good news is that insurance companies are pretty likely to cover a procedure like this because – uh, having having kids is expensive for them. Uh, insurance companies ah. already cover vasectomies. 99% of vasectomies are reimbursed. Um, IUDs and female contraceptives are reimbursed. And so uh, the goal is for Contraline uh, to basically go through a, uh, a plan with insurance companies and the payers to, by the time we are FDA approved, it will be reimbursed with, within that year uh, of being on the market. And so hopefully the cost is going to be little to none for, for people like you. Okay, fantastic. I didn't say I'm doing this yet, <laughs> but I'm not saying I'm not doing it yet. Uh, and you know what? I, I was breathing while you described it and I was able to 
get through the description, it doesn't sound that bad. It sounds like it's going to be something that people will want to do um, to avoid. And that's a, ve that's a very interesting point about God having babies. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in cost that then gets added, especially if they're, I, don't, I hate to use the word unwanted, but I guess unplanned might be a better way to say it. Unplanned children. I don't know why we call them unwanted. That's terrible. Yeah. Uh, but unplanned would be a much more elegant way to say it. The unplanned child is going to cost a ton of money. Any child is. And so if people are not ready to do it and they decide they don't want to uh, terminate the pregnancy, this seems like a greater, a great choice. Um, there's a let's huge, talk a, uh, one moment, there, there's a huge social impact to what we're doing, something I'm really passionate about. Um, to hit on your point, 40% of pregnancies in the U.S., and that's a developed country that uses contraception more than any other country, 40% of pregnancies are unwanted uh, or unintended, I'm sorry, unintended. And so, with Contraline, there there is actually a paper published last year where they looked at uh, a, they did a study and they said if five percent of men use a product like Contraline, a reversible vast occlusive device is is what they call it, then there will be two hundred and fifty thousand pregnancies averted in the U.S. annually. 250,000, wow. and that's going to be millions globally. So there's a huge social impact to what we're doing, uh, and and. Really, our goal is to just offer men more options and hopefully take off some of the burden off of women as well. Yeah, and I think unwanted pregnancy, totally fine. I think about when you say that word, unwanted child is the issue. Unwa maybe unplanned uh, child and unwanted pregnancy, sure. And people don't want to be pregnant. It, it derails or can derail your entire life if you're in college or you know, if you're trying to get your career started and un an un planned pregnancy and unwanted pregnancy could be disastrous. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was how does one test this um, and how does one fund a company as we wrap up here? Those two issues seem to me to be super important. I know you've done a little bit of funding that I participated in a couple million bucks to get you started, but hey, we got four more years to get this thing going. What is the uh, process and are we using animals? Are we doing, how, how does one test a product like this, human trials, do, do we do animal trials beforehand? How does that work? And then how much money will it take you to get a product like this to market? Yeah, great question. So the way we set up fundraising at Contraline, in a way, it might be a little easier for a medical device um, if you have a good idea than, than maybe a tech company because we know what our milestones are. We know what the path to market is. And basically, we need to do a trial in large animals. We're doing dogs. And dogs, have, believe it or not, have the same anatomy and physiology as humans. Uh, yep. My, my co-founder used to say that the paw leads to the hand. Um, and the good news is actually we're doing this dog trial in, this year in 2018. It's a big year for us to show that our product is safe and it works. And with that data, we can go into humans. Um, the, the dog trial, by the way, I just want to let your, your, uh, listeners know we're actually planning on just neutering them afterwards and adopting them. So hopefully this is going to be an extremely humane done at one of the best vet schools in the world, um, to test our product. Once that the dogs won't be euthanized is what you're saying. Exactly. They're Which is what, I mean, sadly, in a lot of medical trials is what happens. I, I mean, I, I don't know if people know that, but that is true. Correct. That that's exactly the point. And so the good news is with what we're doing, we don't need to do that for this trial. And I'm really excited. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to adopt my own dog that was in the first male contraceptive yeah. study. And then we're going to go into humans and we're going to need to fundraise to fund the preclinical, the dog trials, right? And then we're going to need to fundraise to, to fund the human clinical trials. On average, to get a medical device that's implantable, FDA approved, it takes about 30 to $40 million on average. And so it's actually not that much money. I mean, it sounds like a lot, but there's tech companies that raise bigger rounds than that in one, you know, in one round. This is yeah, to get for to, food delivery. <laughs> right. And this is and this is yeah. just to get to market. Uh, exactly. Once we get to market with zero dollars in revenue, we already have an extremely successful company on our hands because we got FDA approval. We have the stamp on the company. We have IP around this. We filed, you know, already eight pants to date. We're filing two pants a quarter to give you a sense of the rate of innovation. Um, and, and then we start to go to market with the product. So that's the way we're actually getting there. And we've had a lot of success fundraising. There's a lot of interest to fund our future rounds as well. And we just got to get, keep getting good data and, and keep showing that this is moving closer to market. 
All right. Well, listen, uh, I'm uh, obviously a big fan and the, the biggest way you can tell if I'm a fan of an idea or a founder is by, do I write a check? And I have written a check to Contraline. I am rooting for you both for society uh, and also because uh, I think it's going to be a great investment. I think it's going to be a great return for our LPs, our limited partners in our fund. Uh, if you want to find out more information about Kevin's uh, mission, which is, of course, to provide men with a safe and effective appealing contraceptive and to level the contraceptive playing field, which to date has been so focused just on women, uh, you can follow Contraline, C-O-N-T-R-A-L-I-N-E, Contraline.com. And Kevin is on the Twitter at Contraline as well. And he is K-F-R-A-T-S, but I hope he's not spending too much time on Twitter. You're not on there arguing about Trump and Mueller and Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, are you? No, no, but I'm following your tweets closely, so... I'm going to ask you to please delete Twitter and Facebook from your phone. Already, Kevin. Did. <laughs> already, you already deleted did? Facebook, Facebook and Instagram. I'm still, I get a lot of news from Twitter. I so. want you to take it off your phone. Only use it on your desktop less than 20 minutes a day. That's my official prescription as an angel investor in your company. I don't want to see you anywhere near Twitter. Stay focused. All right. Sounds great great uh, catching up with you, Kevin. And uh, stay tuned. We've got our next company coming up, which is Spiral Therapeutics. And they're doing something really interesting around our ears and hearing when we get back on This Week in Startups. Ah, uh, yes. Zip Recruiter. Zip, zip, zip. And get those jobs filled with Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring? I'm sure you are if you're listening to this podcast. And I'm sure you're super tired of posting to all these job sites and waiting and waiting to get great candidates. Zip Recruiter has built a platform that finds the right candidates for you. The platform also learns what you're looking for and it identifies people with the right experience and then invites them to apply for your job. And it works. Brilliantly, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate through the site in just one day. You heard that correctly. ZipRecruiter even spotlights the strongest applications you receive, so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there, and ZipRecruiter is how you find them. These invitations that you get have revolutionized how you find the next hire. These invitations go out to people who are qualified, and then zip, 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 with ZipRecruiter, you get that position filled and you get back to work building the next startup that changes the world or the next business unit at your large company, whatever you're building. You need talented people. And here's your call to action. I want you to go to ZipRecruiter.com right now, slash twist, zip, Z-I-P, zip, 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 ZipRecruiter.com slash twist, ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-S-T. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. ZipRecruiter, it is the smartest way to hire. We use it. We love it. All of our portfolio companies are starting to use it. Everybody's got great things to say about ZipRecruiter. And you can follow them on Twitter at ZipRecruiter. And you can say thank you to them on Twitter. Thanks for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. All right, welcome back, everybody. And in our continuing effort to educate me, your host, uh, I'm pleased to have our next guest, Hugo Paris, with me. Uh, I met him because he's got a great idea to uh, and a great product to help people avoid hearing loss. And one of the great things about being an angel investor is I get to have really smart people who spend their careers and lives solving really big problems educate me. And as the audience, you get to draft on this massive education. So Hugo, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jason. And thanks, Jackie, as well for having me. Yeah. Emmy Award-winning producer, Jackie, got you on the program. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Spiral Therapeutics. What are you doing and how does it work? So we are developing a drug for prevention of hearing loss. Uh, We started the company a couple of years ago. Uh, The way the drug works, uh, it gets injected into the uh, the middle ear and that's a hydrogel. And with that injection, uh, we get the product delivered into the inner ear where it preserves uh, the hair cells that are uh, those little uh, cells that uh, transfer the sound into the acoustic nerve uh, for the brain to understand uh, what's going on. And so you put this gel into my inner ear and then the hairs, which normally die over time, is that correct? Or they will die over from abuse, from too loud noises? 
Well, there are many uh, causes of hearing loss. Uh, huh. It could be noise. It could be uh, different types of drugs that uh, are autotoxic, like chemotherapy or ah. uh, aminoglycosides, some types of antibiotics, if you take them uh, at uh, high doses. Uh, and also age. Obviously, aging uh, also produces a uh, loss of those cells in the inner ear. So you're not regenerating those hairs. You're preventing the future loss of the hairs. That's correct. So in a way, it's almost like a vaccine. It doesn't work like a vaccine, but... It is, in a way, a preventative measure. Mm -hmm. So is this something that you ultimately see everybody taking at birth or at 40 years old to maintain their uh, hearing for a longer period of time? Or do you see just in a acute case where I know I'm going to chemotherapy and I get this preventative measure of shooting this polymer? Is it a polymer or is it, it, is, a, it The polymer is the formulation that contains the drug. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, the, the formulation is a polymer. So am I going to do this just in these very acute very narrow cases? Or do you think since we're all going to live longer, I hear now we're going to live to 150, mm -hmm. Peter Thiel is going to make this happen. We're all going to live to 150. So as part of living to 150, our ear, our ears last what, 60, 70 years before we have hearing loss? Well, your ears will last forever. Uh, right. you, you will have them here. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, so your your hair cells will will die over time. Uh, you have. A, when do they typically start dying? I'm curious. Uh, so they, they actually start dying uh, very early on. Huh. Uh, but uh, it's uh, starting around 60 uh, when you start uh, having those those uh, th that hair cell that yeah. produces hearing loss. Uh, but also it depends on whether you've been exposed to noise uh, at uh, an early, uh, earlier age uh, or if you've been exposed to autotoxic uh, drugs. Uh, so do you those... see this of everybody taking it at 60 or just people who are having chemotherapy for now? So uh, the way we're developing our drug is that we are starting with acute uh, uh, types of hearing loss. Uh, so going after autotoxic drugs, and then we will continue with noise. Uh, but the end goal and, and our expectation is that eventually uh, we will be able to target age-related hearing loss. Uh, okay. So somebody, uh, like going to the dentist like three or four times a year, uh, you will receive a shot of our drug, and that will preserve your, uh, your hair cells, your hearing, uh, when you know that you're at risk of losing it. So um, in older uh, patients and in, in, uh, they will go through a hearing check and, and that's something that is happening more and more often. Um, and once you identify that you're starting to lose your hearing, uh, you will be able to receive uh, a shot of, of the product and, and that will wow. preserve the hearing for a longer time. Is it painful to get a shot like this? Um, or is so it just a little pinprick? It's like going to the dentist. Okay. Um, so like getting your Novocaine, no big deal, but you get to hear for the rest of your life. Exactly. So what we do is... Uh, we have to inject uh, through the tympanic uh, membrane, uh -huh. and, and that's a, a little function there. Uh, so what we do is we, uh, typically doctors uh, apply a lidocaine, which is a, a topical uh, anesthetic. That lidocaine is typically just done with a little Q-tip or a swab. That's exactly You put that on right. the outside, numbs mm -hmm. it, without having to get Novocaine or something shot in. Exactly. Then you just do a little shot, a little pinprick, and you're mm -hmm. done. Yeah, that's great. So as a founder of a company like this, how long does it take you to get uh, a solution or a drug uh, to market. What has to happen? It takes too long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what has Here to happen- Here in the United States, it takes too long. And in the EU, it takes too long, right? The EU versus the US, which is faster or more complex? It's, it's pretty much uh, similar. similar? Uh, okay. I think so regulations are slightly different and you have to navigate through uh, different uh, countries and then different health authorities. But in general, uh, it takes a- I heard the EU is a little more open-minded. Is that true? Um, yeah, so as I said, different, different regulations. So yes, they are more open-minded in some ways, but for example, uh, the US uh, will grant us an, an orphan designation to incentivize uh, the development of this product uh, for uh, targeting specifically uh, pediatric population, uh, while Europe wouldn't understand it the same way. Um, so you have different incentives in different places. Um, but in terms of how much, uh, how time, how long it's gonna take us to uh, get the product approved, uh, we are hoping that it will take us another uh, five years approximately. Uh, we started the company two years ago, and we've we've spent two years uh, doing animal testing. Uh, so we're now getting ready to go. How's into the humans. animal testing going, and how, how do you actually execute on that? Um, you use animals uh, that rats, rats Bunnies. mainly. Yes, we've uh, we've used uh, rats and mice, uh -huh. um, and uh, they eventually die because uh, you have to test uh, whether the drug actually got into the inner ear. Uh, so you have to mess up a little bit with them, uh, but that's the way that, that we develop drugs. Um, so yeah, it's it's going well. So we have uh, tested the drug and we've shown that it's uh, effective and it's safe. Um, and with that, we have also interacted with the FDA, uh, and we are now getting ready to go into into human trials. Wow, and. As a startup, what is the funding landscape like? Because 
when you talk about seven years to get to market, most uh, uh, venture capitalists are taking seven years to 10 years to get their return. Mm -hmm. So how does this work on an investment horizon? Uh, how, how would the investors recoup their money? Would it take them 15 years typically? That's a that's a very good question. I think uh, uh, I think there are lots of differences between uh, tech investing and biotech investing. So um, in biotech, typically in the earlier stages, you will still get those angels that are um, the people that are uh, familiar with the space and and they can uh, support a company. And then as you move along uh, in the development process, uh, you will engage uh, professional VCs the same way that happens with uh, with tech companies. Uh, but then around proof of concept, and that's what we call when once you have uh, proven that the drug. Is effective in a, in a specific uh, cohort of patients, um, uh, maybe not statistically, but you have already started showing efficacy. Um, at that time is when uh, the market uh, understand that there's a, a product market fit, right? So um, that's usually when uh, you have the the opportunity to either exit the company through acquisition, so that somebody else takes over uh, that ah. development and continues to fund it, or you take the company public. Um, and it. that's what that's the opportunity for an exit for investors. And when for would investors. the company be able to go public? Would it only go public after the human trials or when it's actually in market? Uh, usually, uh, uh, biotech companies go public during, uh, uh, during trials. Right, uh, so even before the product's in market and there's revenue, they can go public. Yes. And then they'll be public and maybe two or three or four years into being public, the product will go to market. That's correct, yes. So the public markets have an appetite for products that are not even released yet when it comes to biotech because they understand the uh, how big they can get. They do, but they also um, you also see biotech stocks going up and down uh, very often huh. be because uh, usually a lot of uh, uh, drug trials fail. Mm -hmm. um, and you always have the chance to going back and, and redoing a trial or working on it a little bit more. Uh, but that's why you see all those spikes and ah. in, in, yeah. So the one trial comes out, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean that it's over for that company. Exactly. It means they have to do another trial. Mm -hmm. There could have been something flawed about the trial or how it was constructed or... The, des the design, or maybe uh, you need to uh, administer a higher dose, or you go need to go after a different indication, uh, knowing that the drug works, but maybe not for that specific indication. Yeah. Um, so, and how is it going? You moved to Silicon Valley now. You're here. I'm here. If I remember, you were from you came out of Spain, Barcelona, Barcelona, one of my favorite cities, mm -hmm. uh, and it's pronounced Barcelona. Barcelona. I'm told. I don't want to correct you here, but <laughs> you have to put the lisp in, right? That's correct. Because yes. the king had a lisp. <laughs> That's what I was told. He did. He did. The king had a lisp at some points. Everybody put well, that he, he still does. He still does? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how is it going here in Silicon Valley? Are you, are you finding a reception with investors? Are you getting meetings? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, I think uh, this is a great ecosystem, but not, not only from the investor perspective. I think uh, this is a great place to be from um, the perspective of uh, having access to a lot of knowledge and, and, and people that can uh, really help you navigate through a drug development process. Huh. Um, uh, lots of very successful entrepreneurs that are uh, turning to investors and, and, and they, they support us as well. Uh, but I must say that our investor base is uh, pretty broad and, and we have investors uh, in the East Coast, uh, also in Europe. Um, we have uh, one of our lead investors is in Mexico. Um, so we have had access to investors in, in different geographies. Um, yeah, global investors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what about replacing the hairs in the ear? Has anybody made any progress in that of transplanting hairs into there? Or, or are these hairs so unique? Because you only get a certain amount of them when you're a child and that's all you're given, correct? That is right, yes. You, you don't regrow these hairs. They don't regrow. So what you have at birth is what you have at death, uh, minus the ones that have died. Uh, birds are, are uh, one of the uh, animal uh, groups that, that uh, have the ability to re regrow uh, hair cells. Um, really? But uh, not uh, ma mammals. So Interesting. Yes. So there's been some research around that. Uh, but there are a few companies that are working on, on cell regeneration uh, for the inner ear. And those are through uh, gene therapy uh, or uh, different cocktails of drugs that uh, allow the supportive cell to uh, turn into hair cells huh. uh, so that uh, you can uh, theoretically um, recoup all those cells and, and get them reconnected with the, with the acoustic nerve. So it's possible in the future we might even be able to grow them. Yeah, but ideally, if you don't lose them, you don't have to regrow them, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's the approach that we're taking, which what we think is a little bit more straightforward, um, yeah. less complicated. It sounds less complicated. If you don't, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say, right? So if we're able to prevent this. Now, what are your thoughts on life extension? We talk about it a lot here in Silicon Valley and that all of these cancers and 
different uh, reasons we die, the death of cells, at some point will be able to be addressed with gene therapy and other technologies. Do you think we'll have a step function in the amount of years we live here in uh, America, in the developed world, based upon this new technology? Well, I read recently that uh, so the age expectancy in the U.S. just decreased a little bit. It's because uh, of obesity, probably. primarily. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, in terms of being able to extend uh, life uh, uh, span, I, I think that, that would be awesome uh, for some people. Some others would like to die earlier. Huh. Uh, I guess it, that, that would be a choice. Um, I think that will generate a lot of uh, social differences because only yeah. a few people will have access to living longer, right? Uh, only the, the wealthy. Because um, it's going to be expensive. Mm -hmm, there's no sure. way around that. Yeah, and also I think there's no magical uh, thing that you can give somebody and that's going to allow them to live longer and still be healthy. So huh. that will come uh, with uh, diseases in general. So like aging uh, comes with uh, uh, neurodegeneration um, and, and that's going to have an impact in how, how many people will have Alzheimer's and other types of dementias uh, and also hearing loss as well. Uh, so yes, maybe there are solutions that allow people to live a little longer. Um, and I think we're already, I mean, we've ex expanded our lifespan like by 50 years in the past uh, 300 years, right? right. So um, I think that's already, maybe not 50, but uh, but that's already a, a very- That's pretty often that I think the average life expectancy was below 40 years at some point. And yeah. there's a number of reasons for that, but mm -hmm. you know, just the ability to have uh, antibiotics seems to have solved a lot of problems. Oh, and water, uh, yeah. which is also something we could go into because uh, that's a, a recent topic here in, 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 in the Bay Area. Uh, yeah. Having access to clean water is something that, that has also allowed for a longer uh, lifespan. You're referring to the raw water trend here in Silicon Valley? That's exactly what I'm talking <laughs> about. Sounds like the most insanely stupid, pretentious <laughs> thing I've ever heard of. People want to drink water that has not been treated and that turns green a month later. And pay $60. I don't for know where they're going to find it, though. And I, I, water that has never been treated is difficult to find because it, it, it's They're saying it's, from it's some cycle, spring right? so, somewhere, you know. Well, it, come, it came from somewhere. It, it, right. You know, it came from the ocean. It rained. So it's like yeah. same water all the time. So. Yeah. This seems like a huge scam to me. People are charlatans and then people fall for it. But yeah, raw water, don't treat it, don't take the bacteria out. This seems like a recipe for disaster. Anyway, water was one of the things that allowed us to live a little longer. And and obviously that, that comes with uh, uh, diseases that are related to um, aging, of mm. course. And how will you know that uh, you've succeeded here? At what point can you confidently say you've got a, or actually, are you at that point where you confidently feel you have a viable product? Mm. I think as an entrepreneur, you never feel like you you have succeeded, right? There's always yeah. something else that you can do. Um, there's um, with the product that we are developing, there there's the potential to get all the way to uh, treating age-related hearing loss. Um, but to get for us to get there, it could take a, a much longer time than than those five years that I was right. mentioning. So five years is probably for the first indication. Um, so this is a a very you know, like long time uh, experiment, if you will, uh, something that is going to take a long time. And uh, when will I consider that I have succeeded? Um, when uh, the market understands that that's something that works. And, and I think most of the entrepreneurs that are in healthcare are in it because uh, we think that we are, um, we have the ability to develop things that are going to uh, improve quality of life for people. So the day that I see my product um, solving somebody's uh, hearing or preventing somebody's hearing loss, uh, I think that will be the day that I will feel that I have uh, succeeded at, at what I'm doing. That's got to be an amazing feeling that day when somebody can continue to hear. Exactly. Um, there's another technology, cochlear implants. Mm -hmm. Explain how this works. And this, I've, you, everybody's probably watched the videos by now of people on television hearing yes. for the first time with a mm -hmm. cochlear implant. Those are beautiful. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, you can't watch them and not cry unless mm -hmm. you have no heart at all. Tell us about how that technology works. So, broad strokes. I think uh, cochlear implants are uh, the main reason why there are no drugs approved uh, for prevention of hearing loss. Uh, cochlear implants were it's a technology that was developed uh, some uh, 20, 30 years ago, um, and it's it continued to improve uh, over the years. But uh, but that's a, a medical device uh, that allows to uh, insert an electrode into the inner ear, mm. um, very in a very invasive way. Yeah, but, you uh, have to have your ear just totally Perforated. taken apart yeah yeah actually um 
our, uh, the chairman of our scientific advisory board, Charles Lim, who's a professor at UCSF uh, and, and an ontologist here, uh, he recently invited me to, um, uh, to the OR. Uh, to watch to, it. To watch uh, a cochlear Did you faint? Implant. I didn't, no. Yeah, I, I, I was actually faint. worried. He was like, sit here, just don't move because, uh, yeah. you know, just in case. But I was uh, actually pretty, you know, um, I won't say that I, I participated, but at yeah. least I, I watched and I was I was fine with it. Didn't faint. That's good. Um, so that that allows me to explain what exactly is a cochlear implant. Yeah. Uh, so um, you place an electrode into the inner ear, um, and with that um, you allow uh, the acoustic nerve to receive uh, those electric impulses that then uh, are transferred to the brain for them to be understood as a as a, a sound and, and mm. something that you can that you can hear and understand. Um, that has solved uh, the problem of hearing loss for, for a lot of people. It's a very expensive uh, and invasive procedure. $100,000 um, or more. Um, yeah, for the patient in the yeah. end. And, and, you know, like having all the OR set up and the yeah. doctor and everything. The cochlear implant itself is around $35,000, $40,000. Yeah. But yeah. Um, also in different countries, it costs, you know, different. Uh, in Europe, they are financed by the health uh, authorities. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's in general drugs in Europe, drugs and medical devices, healthcare treatments are cheaper in, in, yeah. in on the other side of the world. That's another issue that we could discuss about yeah. uh, drug pricing here in the U.S. Um, but yeah, so um, cochlear implants have uh, they they solve a problem, but they also come with the stigma of having something on your ear, huge outside your ear. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, you can point out at somebody that has hearing loss because uh, you know, yeah. in case they when, when they have a cochlear. So implant. preventing it's a better solution. For that's, sure. That's uh, that's our claim. That's, uh, that's Yeah, I mean, it makes logical sense that if you can prevent it, it's better than having a $100,000 procedure mm -hmm. that puts a huge device on the side of your ear and it's that super invasive. Exactly. And I don't think reversible either. No, it's not. I mean, you're... No, and once you have also perforated the inner ear and gone in there with an electrode, you probably have killed all the cells that were remaining in there. Right. Um, so it's, it's irreversible. Is there going to be the ability to increase our hearing capacity? Um, it make us bionic in a way. In other words, could we enhance our ability to hear? Mm, I guess potentially with um, uh, regeneration of hair cells. Um, if you have a, a you know more a higher population of hair cells in your inner ear, uh, you could potentially hear better. Yeah. Um, there's still the challenge uh, in knowing whether those hair cells are actually going to be connected with a uh, with the acoustic nerve. Yeah. Um, and what that would be like for your brain to have more input. Mm -hmm. But also, if you think about hearing aids or cochlear implants, that's one of the issues is uh, hearing too much. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and, and that's an annoyance sometimes. And, and There's some way to tone it down, I guess. Mm -hmm. They can tone down the electrical impulses or ratchet them back a or bit. You, or you can reduce the microphone. Can reduce the microphone mm -hmm. incoming. Yes. Huh. Fascinating. Well, listen, this is uh, amazing uh, that you're working on this. And uh, people can learn more by going to spiraltx.com. SpiralTX.com. There's not a lot of information on the, not on the yet, website. Not yet, yes. Early so times, early days. To prevent our competitors from copying. <laughs> that no, makes total sense. <laughs> uh, well, we, we are rooting for you, Hugo, in a Thank major you. way. You can follow Hugo on Twitter. He's Hugo, H-U-G-O, Paris, P-E-R-I-S, Hugo Paris, uh, all the way from Barcelona, now in Silicon Valley, and about to change the world by keeping people from losing their hearing. It's just great Hopefully. to meet founders who are trying to solve these kind of huge problems. I think it's it's going to become a growing problem because people are living longer. I think it's going to become one of these things everybody does when they're 60 years old. They just get this to make sure that in case they live to 120, they can hear what's going on. As mm -hmm. you're, These maniacs who are trying to make us live forever, they're probably going to succeed to some extent, but the number of side effects is going to be insane, whether it's Alzheimer's or ears and hearing. We don't even know what will become the next order of, you know, uh, Yeah, some other problems might come up just because we live longer, right? Yeah, I mean, the fact, Alzheimer's, you were just thinking about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Our great-grandparents didn't even know what that is because it's only something, even early onset is probably in the 40s or 50s. Mm -hmm. So most people probably didn't even live to the point of early onset Alzheimer's, let alone full-blown Alzheimer's. Now we're starting to realize, oh wow, our brains start to break down at a certain point. All right, listen, continued success, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.